Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. I have to say this is the fourth uh, one of these events that have happened since I became dean, and the, it's the first one I've been able to attend, so I'm really excited to be here. Uh, we have a really great opportunity here for me not to ask a single question off of this list. Right? So the way that this has gone from what I've seen today, this is a lively audience that has really good questions. We are gifted by having some incredible talent from industry that we're going to talk with. So first and foremost, I'm going to invite them to come up and take a seat. Uh, we have Alan Christian from Bear Crop Science with us, Neil Gutterson from Corteva AgriScience, Aaron Schott from Alenco Animal Health, and Paul Bloom from um, ADM. Uh, as they settle in, I'm going to give each of them a, a bit of a chance to introduce themselves. What I love about the research park, and I mean this with all my heart, you know, we are uniquely situated like no other university has the opportunity to do with having a facility of this caliber with the industry connections and opportunities here this close to campus. It's a gift that's really unbelievable. And for people that have been at University of Illinois for a long time since the research park has been around, People don't know how unique and how different this is. What I love about this place, and this is what I tell people when they ask me, well, what happens there? You know, we do a phenomenal job on campus of making students uh, really familiar with good content. They develop great content skills on campus and some good translation skills. I call that content rich. This is where our graduates become context ready. We make it real here. And, and it's hard to do that in some ways. You know, I, I kind of equate this to driving a car, you know, that behind the book thing that we took? You know, you can read a book, but then you have to go drive the car. And I remember this being one of the most scary days of my whole life, right? The book and the car did not quite assimilate. So practice really matters, you know? So in this context, our students have an incredible gift of being able to work with people in industry on real issues. Our faculty have an opportunity to translate some of the great discoveries that they make on campus into an industry context. And our industry partners can bring things to us, can work with us in a way that makes this whole industry content rich and context ready. And I think that's what it's gonna take to solve some of the big problems in agriculture. I also got very inspired today, and I'm going to be honest about what I thought when I heard this. When I heard Cargill and ADM were working together, I honestly thought to myself, pigs must be flying somewhere. <laughs> right? But that kind of willingness and alignment, it's going to take playing we in a really intentional, concerted way where everybody can maintain some profit potential to keep themselves alive, but we've got to do it in a way that we can actually solve some of these big problems. So I was really hopeful after that comment today, and congratulations to uh, ADM and Cargill for uh, creating some common ground there. So with that, I'm going to give each of you a couple minutes to just introduce yourselves, talk a little bit about what you do, and maybe if you would, talk a little bit about um, what drives you personally in making strategic priorities for the company? Because I think people are curious about that. Like, you know, what, what do you think about when you sit in that place of, okay, this is something that I want to frame around for moving forward? Let's go first, Paul. Thanks, Dean Kidwell. Thanks, everybody, for uh, sticking around to the end of the day. I know it's been uh, probably a, a full day, so we'll try to make sure that uh, it's worth your while. Um, so again, my name is Paul Bloom. I'm responsible for process and chemical research at, at ADM. You know, one of the things that, uh, you know, really drives us is, is kind of the volumes that we process. And we really want to make sure that we are the best stewards of what nature has already provided and what the farmers that you just heard from a, a number of them are, are producing. And that when nature provides that material, that again, we can make the best use of it and, and we get the most efficiency out of it. So think about ADM, right? I mean, my group works on both the process side and then all the new chemical things that we do, the new technologies. But on the process side, we process about 14 acres of corn per minute. Right? We process about 22 acres of oil seeds per minute and about another 12 acres of wheat per minute. Then we have all the specialty things that we do today, which are great fun. But when you think about those big numbers like that, one of the things that drives us is these efficiency gains. And sometimes efficiency gains can be a, a really small efficiency gain. But that efficiency gain times those really big numbers is still a really big number. And that's important, right? Because we have to continue to drive that efficiency and that turns into sustainability. And so that really drives a lot of the things that we look for on the process side. On the chemical side, it's really interesting from a sustainability standpoint to the new different types of, of problems that get 
put to, to us today to solve and the opportunity that, that we have to actually use agricultural feedstocks to solve those. So whether it's from sustainable materials to address issues around plastics waste and to make new sustainable materials that, that can help us both be recyclable and use more material for this, you know, that are, that's bio-based for the circular economy, or to impact, you know, alternate proteins that uh, continue to, to pop up as, as uh, a major trend today. I mean, all of these things are, are really interesting. And then you start to get into microbiome and gut health. So it's all kinds of things that uh, when I came to ADM 19 years ago, I, I really had no idea that I'd get involved in all of these things. But, uh, you know, it's, it's really exciting to be a part of all those different technologies to solve problems. Very good. Thank you so much. I'll just yell. Last time, uh, you may not have heard that, last time I was on First Street was when I walked out of Assembly Hall graduating from the University of Illinois 30 years ago. I'm a, I'm a chemist by training, and I went on to uh, take a job in the pharmaceutical industry at Eli Lilly & Company, uh, which was the parent up until about uh, two years ago of Alanco Animal Health, which was the, the animal health division of Lilly. Uh, Alanco's mission is what we call food and companionship enriching lives. We have really two businesses built within one. The food and livestock business, how do we help animals realize their genetic potential for, for being a source of meat, milk, or eggs uh, for sustainable uh, food on the planet. And then the companion animal side are, are cats and dogs and the, and the companionship they bring us as family members and making sure that we maintain and support their health. Uh, when I think about the, uh, the reason I'm in this 65-year-old startup that just went public a year ago and why I'm going to stay for the next decade, it's because I've made the observation that um, at least the animal health industry for the first time is in animal health for animal health. All of our companies in our industry, animal health, used to be part of something else. They were part of a crop science business where they took the pesticides or insecticides and turned them into flea and tick drugs or, or an anthelmintics to, to prevent heartworm. Or they took the human pharma drugs and turned them into medicines for pets or antibiotics for livestock. And so we are in the beginning of an era where we're innovating in animal health for animal health. That's my assignment at the company. I'm responsible for all new revenue streams that come to Alanco, whether they are generated through our internal R&D or through external means uh, uh, via business development. So uh, it's a great time because um, both of these um, segments of our business require new platforms of technology. The old ones have served the purpose of keeping animals healthy and alive to this point, but antibiotics in 20 years will be used in a very different way than they were 20 years ago, and there will be new technology to replace them. If you look at pet medicines, it's been all about protecting them from pathogens and infections and now you all know right your pets sleep in your bed and they don't suffer from those problems anymore they get um, they get sore joints or they get kidney disease or they they have GI distress and so now we have to take the best of human medicine and apply that uh, for animals for the purpose of products and animal health and that's what keeps me moving thank you so much Aaron all right <clears throat> well good afternoon uh, it's great to be here um, Corteva is a not Two new names still, but they're pretty new. We're just a startup, a $14 billion a year startup, um, as of June of last year. Um, and uh, we merged with, uh, this is the Dow DuPont story, in uh, 2017. And I've spent a good chunk of my uh, professional life in the last uh, two, three years bringing multiple R&D organizations together in order to serve the farmer. And we are an organization that is fanatically focused on the farmer enriching the lives of the farmer and the consumer through how we serve the farmer. Um, we brought together seed, crop protection, uh, digital software uh, capabilities into one R&D organization. And we did that by design. We didn't have three different organizations because our focus is on serving the farmer. And whatever tool we need to serve the farmer, we want to bring together. Now for myself, um, this kind of a, a get together is, is really fun because I spent most of my career actually in startups. And so uh, five and a half years in uh, Corteva and, and its legacy companies, but uh, almost 30 years then in startup companies. So understanding what it takes to create in, you know, innovative solutions from both the lens of a small company, the challenges of being a disruptor, um, and a large company trying to avoid being disrupted, this is a lot of what I, I think about. Um, and if you think about the question you asked, right, what do I worry about and think about strategically, it is really just that. How do we manage to, to innovate in the core and just drive that engine of germplasm improvement and crop protection improvement? 
um, while at the same time attending to the disruptions that are out there, the trends that may change our business. Um, I have a good friend who says that companies can last a long time, but every business is dying. Mm. The moment a new business is formed, it's in the process of dying. And so I'm committed to making sure that as the leader of innovation for Corteva, that we serve the farmer today, but equally well in 10 or 15 years. And so when we formed our strategy, and we did this this past year, refreshed our strategy, we looked at the 2035 as the anchor for creating our strategy for the next five years. So that's a little flavor of maybe some of the topics we can touch on. Thank you so much, Neil. Alan? Thanks. Uh, my name's Alan Christian. I'm with Bayer. And uh, we also have been undergoing a transformation over the past couple of years as Monsanto and Bayer have come together. Uh, I was looking at the slide uh, on, the, on the projector, and it's different to the one in the book uh, with regards to my title. And that's because in the middle of planning attendance at this meeting, I changed jobs. And that, that's kind of the story. Um, so I didn't, I didn't start in ag. My, my world is in an ag. I grew up in the mountains in Colorado, not, not so much ag. And I, I've been with this industry for the past 15 years, and I've moved a fair amount through R&D, corporate strategy, and manufacturing, with the uh, end result that, that I've never felt really comfortable where I was. And the value of that is that in this industry, as, as Neil says, you know, it's, you have to change all the time. So starting off in R&D and then moving into uh, to manufacturing, it was an entirely different mindset. And the goal of, of moving me into manufacturing was that we'd focused forever on, on products. And it was made very clear to me from the day I started that our focus was the customer, that the grower was, was everything to us and what we did had to have a positive impact on the grower. And having spent a lot of time doing that, uh, they decided that uh, a valuable thing to do, my, my, the leadership at, at Bayer, was that moving into uh, production R&D, looking at how we did things, not just what we did, and developing an R&D capability around our manufacturing space. And that was, that was an eye-opening experience for me because the mindset in R&D is radically different from the mindset in production. You don't have the luxury of making too many mistakes in production. Mm -hmm. So I had to completely reformulate my, my vision of how R&D was conducted. And recently um, left that role after seven years and moved into uh, outside innovation and strategic partnership, which is actually a very similar role in R&D, but working with uh, startup companies and external partners also to develop new capabilities. So it's uh, always had the same focus on the customer and looking at how we, how we do what we do and focusing on the change. And that's how we end up evaluating our strategic priorities. Pretty good. Thank you so much. Has there been a question submitted yet? First one. How do you respect growers' data privacy while pursuing data insights to drive innovation in your industry? Seems like this is a recurring question, so it won't be a surprise to any of you. So I will let you choose. Unless there's an awkward science, then I will pick one of you. <laughs> How do you respect growers' data privacy while still gaining insights from their experiences that helps you innovate as an industry? I mean, I would just say that, um, you know, the, we have the granular division of Corteva. We have clear statements about data privacy and our policies, both from the Corteva overall and, and the granular um, business um, segment. Um, but clearly the farmer owns their data. Um, we um, obviously get access to that data through the work we do with farmers, and um, we only use that in aggregated ways to develop better products and solutions uh, going forward. So um, we take extremely seriously um, that the farmer owns that data, and that data has real value to them. Other thoughts on that? Um, Al Alanco has a, a division called Alanco Knowledge Systems, very similar kind of concept in, in which we aggregate producer level data into benchmark uh, references and we can use that either for modeling production systems that might um, uh, adapt their practices to reflect what they might see in the benchmark activity or we can use it to just um, provide uh, you know, data and analytics for the, for the, the uh, producer themselves to do their own homework. Um, I think there's a couple of things. Obviously, the de-identification of it and the pooling of it uh, solves a lot of the problem. I think one of the perils of 
operating in a space like this is there are people out there who, who don't believe industry has this consumer's best interest in mind. And that really why we might be doing pooling this data is so that we can actually fix prices or take uh, non-competitive practices to another level because of the combined um, data. And we've had some experience with that in terms of lawsuits and those kinds of things. So I think to say our industry and our companies take it very seriously, we do, because on the other side of it is a dangerous potential threat, but it's also an opportunity to tell our story in a better way. Um, and, uh, and I think the motivation ought to be pure that we're helping our customers do their job better, not trying to take advantage of those customers because we're exploiting in da the data in ways that they, c they won't appreciate. Very good. I couldn't agree more with, with both sentiments. I would say that, that data clearly are the future of our industry and, and there's real value to the data. The grower owns their data. Um, if they choose to, to share it with us, there's clear constraints on, on what can and can't be done with it. Um, I think that the trust really becomes the, uh, the driver with, with, with data security, and you've got to earn that trust. And if the trust is compromised, you've, you know, you, you've got to, to work through that. But uh, I, I think data will be an, an ongoing part of our industry. So it's incumbent upon we uh, in, in corporate ag to to make sure that we understand that we're the ones accountable at the end of the day for making sure the data security is a, a real and, and trustworthy thing. Very good. Another question or are we good? Do you have one? You're good, okay. Paul, I'm gonna let you take this one next. Uh, when, when you think about the future, what technologies are coming our way that you think are gonna transform or expand the industry dramatically? Yeah, so there's a number of, of technologies. Great question of what technologies are going to help us expand the future. You, you know, I think it starts with some of the different trends that we're seeing today on on what uh, things are, are facing, what do customers want, right? We just talked about data. And as we think about, as we see this information come in from customers, you know, I think one of the big things that is leading is sustainability, right? And we've talked about that at the uh, all day. And so sustainability takes a, a number of different forms. You know, when you start to think about sustainability, you can think about how do you do field to market the right way? So obviously we're participating in that. And so some of that innovation and in those technologies are these digital transformations where you, know, you need to make sure that you're aggregating that data and making sure that the customer is gonna get the true knowledge of, of what they're gonna see at, when, they're, when they're selecting their products, right? You're gonna start to see customers walking around the store with their handheld devices, their smart devices, pointing that at the, at the label saying, okay, this is where the material was sourced, this is how it's sourced, we believe in the way that the companies treated not only our data, but the way that they behave, that the way that they process, and that it's a complete package, right? It's, it's everything that, that goes into that. So I think that's, that's one aspect. The next level of sustainability is really the technologies that we use that are kind of behind the scenes. So technologies, how do we process water, how do we use water, how do we use energy, how do we do emissions reduction? I think that's gonna be really critical. And then what, what do we do? How are we transparent with that information? So for example, you know, we've been really working hard on water reduction um, to make sure that products have better sustainability. And just this year, we released a, a number with uh, our partner in the water side, Nalco, that we've been able to reduce our, our water usage by 2.3 billion gallons annually. And so now that number has also continued to improve because you know if you're if you're not moving forward, you're moving backwards. So we're up to 2.6 billion uh, gallons of water now that we've been able to reduce uh, on an annual basis. And just to to give you an idea of what that looks like, that's about the same water requirements for about uh, 8 million people annually. So it's substantial numbers on water reduction, and then. You know, I think beyond that, then you start to get into, you know, what are the products and technologies that consumers are demanding? What are the, what's the new technology that's gonna drive things uh, next? So you start to see more things in um, alternate proteins, right? Where, where you've got more plant-based uh, proteins that are hitting the market. Obviously a big trend right now that's driving a response, that's increasing demand changing the, the need for different crops, starting with crops all the way through to the processing that's required to put those in place. Um, we've started a new pea protein plant. 
Beyond that, though, the demand for soy protein keeps going, but in general, the demand for protein continues to increase. So you really have to take into account, and obviously we completed our acquisition of Neovia, so that's a complete feeds business, it also has uh, com you know, uh, pet nutrition, companion animals were mentioned, so the, the trend that you know, we're treating our animals more like our family members, and our, our specifically our pets and companion animals, and so when you put all those things together, you know, coming up with technology that, that satisfies those needs are, are really important. I think then you start to get into things that, you know, you may not associate with agriculture. So how do we solve um, problems and create new demands, new demands for our farmers, for the crops that they produce today? So we get really excited about things in the sustainable materials side. So we have a great program with DuPont uh, to make a renewable monomer, a, a monomer that's based on fructose. And so we're actually taking fructose and making a component for PET or plastics. And many of you have water bottles that are sitting around your table made from this PET. And so this type of material, you know, when you think about on average, the world uses about a million bottles a minute. So what can we do to make sure that we can help reduce the amount of plastic to deliver the same amount of performance to customers? And this is where you wouldn't associate this with agriculture necessarily, but we're actually able to use fructose to then make a component that can help lightweight PET bottles by up to 20%. So think about those million bottles. How can we deliver those same million bottles with 20% less plastic every minute? And those are big things that you wouldn't necessarily associate with, with agriculture, but something that fructose and you know, looking at the chemistry of what's provided can really change and, and shift kind of the demand of where we used to put those molecules inside the bottle and carbonated soft drinks, but now we're actually making that plastic out of, out of those materials. Very good, thank you. In light of honoring the crowd, we're going to go to Laura and, and see what the next question was. We've got a bunch that are pouring in. I'm going to take oh, one from great. Sam Ethington, Chief Scientific Officer at Climate, asks from an industry perspective, wait for it, because we're going to be on the receiving end of this one maybe, what, from an industry perspective, what challenges do you face in working with a university or startup companies? I, I need a pen. <laughs> <laughs> Well, none, of course. <laughs> Outstanding answer. Not, not the University answer. of Illinois, obviously. I mean, Berkeley, <laughs> on the good. other hand, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> good answer. Um, no, I mean, I think, um, look, we, we, we partner, we collaborate, um, and, um, you know, I think that the, the key issue is, from my experience, having people in the university, you have real practical experience, and you started with the story about driving, right? Mm -hmm. If people are at the university and they've actually had, they've cut their teeth also on building businesses and working in industry, that's a tremendous advantage to then working with companies. Mm -hmm. And some of the best groups we work with um, have people in their technology transfer groups who have that exact experience. So, um, you know, I think that actually overcomes a lot of the sort of inherent barriers that otherwise might be there. Mm -hmm. Other comments on that? I would just say from uh, maybe from an animal health perspective, the one thing I would observe is we don't enjoy the same kind of um, uh, venture capital attention that maybe other industries do. There's no actually dedicated investing in animal health. Um, at the same time, I think, um, uh, so, so any industry uh, or any, any academic center that wants to play in the incubator space, that's a great opportunity. Um, and um, to, br to bring to bear not only the sort of be the catalyst for the attraction and formation of cattle, uh, capital, but then also be the, the venue whereby which companies like mine can enjoy some kind of relationship so that we, we share some risk but share reward together. One of the things I experience a lot is um, a lot of invitations to come where, you know, somebody's opened up a new part of their campus and would like Alanco to pay for a building to be there. Um, and I sort of ask the question, what's the purpose of it? Well, you tell me and then you pay for it. So that's, that's no different than a real estate transaction. So sure. I'd like to see more creative um, sort of value creation orientation than just depositing assets places. Absolutely. May I answer this one too? Or at least and Laura's looked at me like, okay, she's going she's to shut the laptop now. She knows me. Um, 
<laughs> so for me as dean, I, I think the confidentiality piece is challenging for us to navigate in some ways because we're trying to figure out how to give fabulous people credit for their contributions, train the next generation of experts in their fields, and you know how, how to fund this enterprise called a university as well. You know, when, and sometimes I wonder things like, if you all could tell each other the truth about what you knew, what could we solve? You know, if, we, if all the cards were on the table and we all knew, and I think this is true for researchers as well, you know, because it's a competitive market all the way across the, the realm, you know, what, what could we really solve together that we can't do individually? You know, I, like I'm challenged by that and I'm curious about what you think about that. I mean, you know, as I mentioned before, I had a lot of experience in small companies. And one of the things I observe, frankly, about large companies is they think that everything we understand or know is deeply insightful and we don't want to share it with other people because it'll be used in some fashion to compete against us. Mm -hmm. And so um, overcoming that a bit, you, we want to share, and I think we've done more of that in the last several years at Corteva, what are the problems we really care about? You know, I've watched academics sometimes solve a problem and I think, why are they solving that problem? Well, probably because we didn't share with them what's really important. So, you know, we did start an open innovation port, you know, portal a couple of years ago. We tried to put out there some of the problems that we really want to have solved directly with challenges, right? Explicit challenges, but also the areas we care about. Um, so I hope we're doing a better job. You could certainly tell us if we're not, but I think that's a key piece, right? Being willing to actually tell you what we really care about and um, hold us to that. Okay. Yeah, I, I would fully agree with that and add that a lot, so there's the temptation in a big company, I came from a government background where they think everything is secret. The, uh, um, really, the uh, temptation in a big company is to think that, the, that everything needs to be close held because it's, because it's valuable. And the, the reality is that, that that's not nearly as, as often true as, as you might think. And when you, we do a lot of collaborations with universities and there's discussions on what, what should we let happen, what should we do, and the answer is almost everything. Because the reality is that most of the things that we're working on are sort of intrinsically valuable broadly, but not, not specifically. So a lot of the stuff we do around our, you know, our quality data and our testing and so forth, all of the, uh, the major companies will share those data and those information because it's important for everybody. And it's important that nobody learns a thing and keeps it to themselves because it has a negative impact on the industry. So areas like that are places, I think, where the, a lot of our companies are already uh, operating very transparently. And I, I suspect there's probably more areas. I think one of the biggest risks that you run is, again, like the others on the stage have commented, is, is the risk of not putting in the right information up front, right? Because you can only expect to get out you know, if you put in the right information up front to say these are the grand challenges. So then I think it becomes incumbent on the companies participating to say, look, if we do have some concerns about that information that we're putting in to, to put these challenges forward, <laughs> then it's also up to us to put in the right inputs on the training and make sure that everybody in the programs understand confidentiality. And, and so we spend a lot of time not only on you know, do we put in the right inputs, but do we set up the programs from the very beginning? We don't expect everybody to understand all of the details on how to set up the program the best way, but then communicate that, set the expectations for the team, and really make it a team. Make it a team that could work together. And then, you know, there are a lot of things that come out that you'd never imagined. And I think those are the biggest innovations, and, and those are what you want to see anyway coming out of those programs. Very good, very good, good comments. Yes, ma'am? We have one from a PhD student at the University of Illinois who wants to know what are the biggest challenges you face after acquisition or merger of companies? And most of your companies go through a bunch of these. They're all chuckling. I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> well, I, I'll probably take that one to start if it's okay. Um, you know, so ADM, it, it's, it, it hits home. So since 2014, we've had about 29 acquisitions. Um, mainly in the, in the nutrition space, both in animal and, and human nutrition. Um, you know, so starting with, in 2014, it was wild flavors. Um, you know, we, we made this great decision to say, like, look, we need to not only be able to make food products, but they need to taste good. So that's probably important. And you know, so as we continue to grow our pantry, we continue to add all these different specialties. And I, I can say that one of the things that's really tough is to integrate kind of all that information, all the knowledge that's coming from all of these new acquisitions. 
Every, what you don't want to do is, is take on a company and then, you know, kind of squash the, the creative things that they've been doing or change the, whatever the, the secret is that's made them work. You want to keep that. You want to keep that alive. So you have to do that from a culture perspective. You have to do that from an information perspective. But you also have to figure out what did you actually acquire. You only have so much time when you're in the M&A section to actually get all that information. And then the real learning comes from that synergy that, that is there. So how do you really get one plus one to equal you know, three? Or maybe if you're doing well, it's 2.2, .2, right? So you know, how can you get that to work? So you know, we're putting in better systems to really help us with this. We have a big program called 180M. It does more than just help with, with M&A. Um, but it really is how do we integrate, how do we understand what we're doing and have platform systems that operate across all of our businesses so we, we use unified systems, we can access the right information and then you know, be able to make those connections better internally. We have the saying that if ADM kn knew only what ADM knows, right? And, and so it's really tough to try to find that in, in a big company sometimes. So, Relying on better digital solutions, uh, you know, is, is better than just saying, yeah, I, I know that person over there and just kind of picking up the phone and calling everybody, which is kind of the way it used to be. Very good. Aaron, do you have a comment about that? Uh, yeah, and we're on the, so our, my colleague down the, down the street here uh, is the uh, parent company of Bear Animal Health, and we announced an acquisition to, a, to acquire Bear Animal Health back in August and are in the midst of working through the antitrust period. Um, when I joined Elanco, uh, the first um, week I was there, we were wrapping up the conclusion of the integration plan for Novartis Animal Health. So we've done two major, we'll, we'll have done two major animal health uh, acquisitions combinations. And I think the contrast couldn't be more clear in our minds based on the integration approach we took with um, uh, Novartis Animal Health, where we said we would be better together. Um, than how we approach uh, bear animal health, that we are building something and they are going to contribute to what we're building. It's a very different orientation. We have growth as a mindset. We are focused on retaining talent. We are focused on the, the precepts of the business combination as the elements of the strategy going forward, not just saying how do we make the most of what we have now that we know what we have. Um, and so we've got a much more disciplined and focused attention to the details about where value is going to be created in the combined entity and we're gonna be pretty undeterred about realizing an organizational model um, and footprint and investment strategy that supports that. Good. Um, and that's just learning, right? Uh, just through cycles of doing Got this. It. I'm gonna let Alan speak to that because they're connected, then they all go to you. Alan, do you have a comment? As a matter of fact. As a matter um, of fact, you do. <laughs> you know, it was, it was funny. I was part of the integration team uh, working for 18 months before the, uh, before the close in day one. And we spent a lot of time worrying about that exact question. What was going to be the hardest part? And oh, we fretted about every third thing. And we, we'd get together as part of these integration meetings and we'd go out to dinner and, and you, you know, you, you'd get up and, and you know, step out of the room and come back. And you couldn't tell after a few of those conversations who was with which company anymore. One of your biggest concerns was were, were people going to get along? And the reality was absolutely. We're all the same people, right? You got out of college, you might go to this company, you might go to that company, you're the same person. You, you worry about really prosaic things like you know, the, the dress code. You know, half the people are going to be walking around in, in sport coats, the other half will walk around in jeans and t-shirts. And the reality is you're all walking around in dockers and polos. But so it's, it's, the, it's the, the annoying things. The IT system, integrating two IT systems is an epic pain. But it's upside. It's so awful that everybody hates it. And it's turned into one of the best team building exercises <laughs> that, that you've ever seen. So. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know how I thought it would be, but as far as the, the people and the work and just getting stuff done, it, it feels honestly, you know, after the first six months or so, quite seamless. You know, I have, as, I have as many close friends with Legacy Bayer as I have with Legacy Monsanto when we really feel like one company. It'll be a while before all the systems are sorted out and people with, you know, this computer system can talk to people with that computer system, but that's more an annoyance than a problem. The real challenge is, now that you have this, this thing, you know, what, what marvelous opportunities can you take advantage of that you couldn't before? And that is the same problem you always have, strategically, tactically, what cool things can we do? And you, you have more options, but the same challenges. Very good. Neil, would you like to close that one up? Yeah, maybe just two quick ones. Um, so two very different examples. One is on uh, September 1st, 2017, we acquired 
um, granular the same day we merged between Dow and DuPont. Um, and since there are some colleagues in the room here, um, we debated quite a bit. Do we integrate them fully, make them Corteva from day one, or keep them a little separate and give them a time to adapt and, and be themselves and, and maintain the best of that culture that they brought in? And we did that. We actually thought that the best way to create value from granular was to let them have their culture primarily. And if you go to, I'm sure, the site here, there are some words on there that won't be the same words that are in my office in, uh, in Johnston. Um, so, uh, and over time, you, you, you adapt that. The other thing I would say is um, the Dow DuPont, that was a merger of equals. Mm -hmm. And each company was very healthy. It wasn't like one healthy company acquiring an ailing company. And so how do you get people to move off of what they liked and what actually had worked well onto something new? And so we created a new name, a new purpose. We did this very intentionally. And, and Jim Collins, I think, as a CEO, was really brilliant in saying, let's get a new culture. Let's really establish that destination, and it's different. The language is different, the words we use are different, um, the values are framed differently, and it's been incredibly effective. Fabulous. That was an outstanding question from a PhD student, by the way. As you know, we have smart students. Do we, we have extraordinary <laughs> students. Do we have another question? We do. We have a question from an investor from Inova Memphis, who was an earlier panelist. Could you share your thoughts on how companies embrace innovative startups? whether that's via paid pilots, investments, licensing. Similarly, to what extent do novel innovations come to you today from outside your organizations? I'm, I'm gonna edit that question just a little bit too. So there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the room and a lot of people that have startups. When do you choose to do it yourself and when would you outsource them to do it? Kind of in that context of embracing. You, Aaron, start. you're gonna take that one on? Okay. Yeah, so, uh, R&D, at least in the life science uh, sector that I operate in, is a shots on goal game. And so we, uh, as a strategy, we sort of have a stated strategy about two thirds in, inside, one third outside, as a general mix. Um, and I, I have investments in venture funds, and we have uh, senior leaders from my R&D team sitting on the investment committees of those venture funds. We have relationships with small companies where, in essence, we're seeding pilot projects for them that will actually help them raise money for their next round and may give us a, a useful advance for one of our programs. So, so I think we are highly engaged, but we don't we don't see it, we see it as redundant for a purpose. We need more good ideas flowing um, because you never know which piece of data is going to come along and take out what you thought was the best idea, and now you need something else. The other thing is, I think we try to maintain a humility that. Uh, around the mind share for innovation that we possess inside the company. Probably less than 5% of our industry's total mind share sits inside the, the R&D labs of Alanco. Mm -hmm. That means 95% of the mind share sits elsewhere. We gotta have some mechanism for, for penetrating that and, and engaging that. Very good, Neil? Uh, you know, I would, um, m my perspective is that we often, uh, looking at some new area, think about the technology and talent needed. And sometimes you don't wanna hire talent or invest in technology internally until you figured out whether it's worthwhile. So in those cases, particularly in areas of disruption, we'll look for where can we find that technology and talent sitting in small companies. The other thing I would say is that in that area of disruption, um, we know that it's about technology and business model. And sometimes it's easier to test out a new business model with a small company. Um, there's a lot less at risk and, and you know, a failing of a small early stage company is deeply painful. Don't get me wrong, I've lived that. Um, but it has a smaller context to it and we can help buffer that. So um, those are the three things I say we look at to, to, fo to foster and feature in those relationships with small companies. Fabulous. Paul? Yeah, at, at ADM we have a ventures group, and, and so the ventures group does a few things. One, they invest in you know, technology startups so we can you know, make sure that we're aligning some of these new adjacencies that, that we see as, as real growth opportunities. So we have a number of those, and then they also invest actually in our own internal startups. So it's a little bit different uh, from, a, from a venture standpoint, but we try to treat the, the internal startups that we have like their own companies, give them a little autonomy and say, okay, you're gonna be treated the same as our, our, some of these external ones. And then we also do a lot of joint development uh, with, with companies. There may be an investment, there may not be an investment, but uh, you know, I think this is a really good way for startup companies to work with a large company, really get that critical information, what's gonna be successful so we can align, we can share, we can be transparent, 
we can leverage each other's technology the best. But you know, it doesn't always have to be a, a direct investment. A lot of times, the the value comes from the knowledge that's shared under in some type of a joint development agreement. Very good. Paul, do you have a comment? So companies intentionally or unintentionally, de they declare their core competencies based on what they invest in, and our investment strategy is is twofold. I mean, there's there's our core competencies, and there are people who are working in areas in which we consider ourselves to hold a core competency, but they're doing a thing maybe in a really focused way that might put them ahead of us. And, you know, that's fantastic as far as we're concerned. They might come to us, we might go to them and help them, you know, we'll f through funding to continue to get better, and I can think of a couple companies now we're doing that with, um, so that, that we don't have to put more into it internally. We can leverage what somebody else has already done, some group of smart people has figured out. And there's also stuff that, that we aren't working on at all in completely um, maybe adjacent or completely orthogonal spaces. And people have come to us and they've gotten us interested in it or we've gone to them because we're interested in leveraging that with maybe something else that we're doing. So core competencies and, and orthogonal and adjacent spaces are the two areas we invest in and, and we're happy to do both of those. Fabulous. I think that was all good news for those of you that are interested in working with these folks. Question? So we had a digital panel earlier, but there is a question about use of machine learning and artificial intelligence in your businesses. Is that on your, on your minds? And, and if so, what application areas? I can start. Um, it's definitely on our minds. I mean, if it's not on your mind, I, I think you know, you've been probably sleeping for the past uh, at least five years, maybe 10. Um, but you know, when you think about AI, machine learning, things like that. I mean, it takes kind of everything from from operations. So we're doing a lot more um, just with you know how do we think about data analytics to continue to improve our processes. Um, but you've you've also seen I think Grainbridge was maybe mentioned earlier today, but we also have uh, another one uh, called Covantis. So that one is really. How do you use a better AI, blockchain, more machine learning, and, and build a better digital platform for just global trade and, and grain shipments in general? So this was one that just floored me. But you think about global trade and, and grain shipments, and I, I knew nothing about this, uh, but it, it takes uh, about 275 emails and this is how this has been working, 275 emails to do about 11,000 shipments a year of you know, large ocean-going cargoes. And for the past 30 years, everything's been done by basically email and you know, keying in data, re-keying in data. So you know, I think this is a great example of how um, ADM, Bungie, Cargill, and Louis-Dreyfus have got together to put this in place to, to really cut out efficiencies, make sure that you don't have um, errors, you know, 80% error reduction, things like that, um, reducing, you know, rekeying data, and then, you know, really using blockchain and AI to make sure you can manage these global trades uh, appropriately. Very good. Neil? Yep. You know, we've been um, obviously using that sort of technology for a long time in the R&D organization. Um, I'd give an example of the breeding organization. So on the field side, it's really important, right? There's so much environmental variability that um, we need enormous um, reproducible data across many different environmental contexts. And so, you know, we're gathering data on many different parameters, which f even five years ago, we still had students, they were probably summer students from University of Illinois, walking out with sticks, measuring the height of plants or the width of a stem, so I mentioned it earlier. And now that it's all done from drones. Mm -hmm. And um, we can only do that because of machine learning application that we can now measure the height of a plant and the height of the ear. Uh, we can use drones and satellite imagery and even on the ground kinds of uh, proximal sensing. So all of those are enabled by artificial intelligence. Uh, Jochen Chiol, who's on my team, is, was sitting around here somewhere, maybe he's outside talking to someone. Um, he leads our DSI group and now we're actually driving that even more into other parts of the organization. And finally, I'd say, in many ways, what we do in R&D is a little early glimpse in what we might bring to the farmer. And so it's a way of almost testing ourselves um, some of the ideas that we would bring to farmer in terms of using drones to inform decisions on a field. Um, some of that would happen even in our supply chain and production organization as another place to beta test some of those applications based on uh, artificial intelligence. Very good. We probably have time for a couple more questions. So this one will be uh, to Aaron to Paul. What's the question? 
Is there another question? Well, there is, but I was going to say, this one is more at the seed companies, perhaps. What and how fast can a new novel crop be developed? Hmm. We might want to readjust who answers that. <laughs> you want to take a shot at it? Aaron, you want to take a shot at that? Or pass? Not fast enough. <laughs> Great. A new novel crop, huh? Um, is that... Was, did I hear that this right? This is like a pre bad prelim question, right? Yeah. <laughs> there were several that were more specific, but I was just going to try. I can, I can ask another one if we want. We're going to pass on that one, and whoever asked that, I'll, I'll attempt that one myself later. Okay, we're going to do Too a different one. Too long is the answer on the floor. What should we do as an industry to make sure consumers understand new technology to ensure that we have freedom to operate as we improve agriculture? Oh, that's a good question. Do you, want to, do you want to take that on first? Well, I, I the, the, the mic is up, the sorry. highest. Just, yeah. It's to you. <laughs> it was still on. Um, so to ensure that we have FTO as we develop new capabilities. So we, uh, th th this is obviously a key thing. And it's, we, we sometimes conflate IP with FTO. And a lot of things we talk about wanting to have IP on in this industry, right? So you have patent protection on it and so forth. But what you really mean is you want to be able to use it. And it's less important to you that anybody else be able to use it so much that you be able to use it. And you know, th this, is, this has represented something of a shift where, where 15 years ago, if you, if you thought anything up, you had to file a patent on it. And that got expensive and it got slow and, and it wasn't always the most advantageous way to go about things. So for my money, and obviously IP is very important, uh, in a space like we're in, I, I think FTO becomes the most important thing. And, and the way to do that is uh, obviously up front, you want to make sure that, that if you're doing a thing, it isn't already patent protected. Um, and you know, if you've developed a thing, you have to have a serious discussion about what the upside to uh, patenting something is going to be. And if there isn't a real upside, then, then you want to just release you know, the information so you can leverage it and so that other people won't pat that out from under you and then everybody has the FTO. I would say that, you know, as an example, and this is, this is kind of a mundane example, but it's so important, our, uh, uh, seed health. So testing of seed health is, is all the seed companies move seeds all over the world. Um, you know, there's, there's diseases that can, that can impact seeds and this is a huge thing. And, you know, certainly the, you know, our policy and I think within, within the various seed health organizations spanning the companies, those data are shared and, and tests that people develop tend to be made pretty available because the FTO around being able to move these seeds is so much more important than any IP you might have on a test that you might develop that, that we just don't tend to patent those things. So ho hopefully that answered the question. We're good. Paul, you have so a comment? Maybe just to take that another level, I think maybe part of the question was about how do we make sure that the, the market understands the tech safety of a technology or gets comfortable adopting a technology. and. So if that's the sort of direction a little bit, let me say that when I think back to the era of GMOs, which I lived through, um, the, uh, we spent a lot of time thinking about how do we educate the market? And uh, that was just a mistake. I mean, I hate the word educate when we think about our customers or our consumers. Um, engaging with them, having a dialogue with them, understanding the values that our, um, you know, the new technologies might enable to be acted on through products uh, in the marketplace, that's the kind of dialogue we have. I mean, genome editing is the classic example for me today that I've spent a lot of time on. Um, we have a lot of listening sessions. We've helped, you know, sponsor some conferences which are designed to really just engage um, consumers and, and farmers and the entire supply chain. So Very that's good. A key piece. Laura, I'm going to actually close this up unless you're going to give us more time. Okay, so the last question, and I'd like each of you to address this. There, there are uh, some students uh, in the room curious about what the uh, workforce looks like in 2015 in essential, essential skills that people need to make sure that they're, they're acquiring before they hit the workforce. Let's come this way. Let's, let's, go, let's go down the road from Paul and come back this way. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Alan, and come back this way. Essential skills the yeah. uh, students yeah. need. Yeah. What does the workforce look like in 2050? And essential skills people really should try to acquire before they graduate. So that that would be that would be quite a technical prediction. So uh, in, in terms of uh, what I think are, are universal skills that we don't every time see, but universities are getting better at this. Um, being able to to work in teams. It's very rare that. Uh, 
that a person works as an individual in a company. It's almost always a team-based thing. And at least when I was going through engineering school, the vast majority of what you did was, was entirely individual-based, with a very few exceptions. I see universities changing this now and having much more team-based programs, and I think that's incredibly valuable. I think uh, communication, you know, once again, speaking for, for engineering school, very rarely did we have to get up and actually put presentations together. The most we would have to do is solve problems on the board, and that wasn't a very interactive experience unless you had the answer wrong. And, <laughs> so, and, and I think uh, it was said earlier in a different panel that, uh, that being good at more than one thing, or at least being conversant with a bunch of different things, you can be an engineer or an agronomist or, or you know, an MBA or what have you, but it, it's really valuable to understand other fields and how they'll intersect your field. So intersectionality, communication, and operating in a team-based environment, I would say, are three of the key things that will be universal and, and important. Perfect, perfect, thank you so much. Neil, what do you think? I'll, I'll just um, echo the one about communication, you know, being a good storyteller, communicating well, you know, even if you're in sort of STEM, that's really critical. I think the idea of also thinking about data in a different way. I mean, when I grew up, it was little projects, right? Little, the data around that project is all you had to think about. But data as an architectural design feature, that's a whole new way of thinking that we need to have from the new workforce of the future. Very good. Aaron, what do you think? I would um, probably select three, three concepts. Uh, curiosity, um, bias for action, and resilience. Um, and I think about it in the context of maybe a technically based workforce where, in essence, um, I do think this concept that all innovation happens at the fringe of knowledge bases, not at the center of, of them in the future. So that curiosity to cross over and interrogate, uh, the bias for action, do the experiment, get the result, get it behind you. Don't live in the experiment, live for the result. And then finally, resilience, because the result is often what you didn't want. You have mm -hmm. to be able to put it away and move on to the next one. Very good, very good. Final comments, Paul? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, very, in very similar fashion, you know, I think it's about how do you develop a growth mindset, right? I mean, you can have a fixed mindset and say, like, I've got the right answer and this is what's going to be, or you can have a growth mindset and say, like, this is my best answer and then, you know, what does everybody else have, right? And then how do we get better? How do we learn from the mistakes that we make? Look, I'm a scientist, so, you know, 98%, maybe 99% of the things that we have ever done in the lab fail. Right? So it's about how do you learn from that, how do you get better, and continue to, to get better together. Right? And, and so I think you know, this, just having that openness and, and the ability to have a growth mindset really changes the way that you see the world and the way that you can make progress. Oh, that's fabulous advice. I think the good news there is in 2050, uh, people will still be involved in food production based on what they said. That's good news for all of us. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So please join me in thanking these fabulous gentlemen for their comments. Well done. I, I would suggest if you asked a question we didn't get to, that maybe you, uh, you approach one of them and ask them this as well. So thanks so much, everybody. And uh, I think it's to you to close it up, my friend.